seem um, initially a little bit confusing as far as what I'm going to tell you about. So you know, I'm sure you've been told repeatedly so far today, today of uh, this next summer school, that liquid crystals really are liquids as far as where the positions of the molecules are. Right? You have this orientational order, but um, you, for pneumatics, you have you know, sort of everywhere the positions are where they want to be, and they, they flow like this. And so what, what is this solid body mechanics business that I'm going to talk about? How, how is this going to make any sense? And so hopefully I'll convince you rather quickly that there are systems that you can talk about elasticity, you can talk about real uh, solid things in connection with liquid crystal effects. Um, uh, I should tell you in advance that uh, I don't have any, any clicker questions uh, for you, so there will be no points Boarded. However, please do interrupt me with questions if you have them, and there will be towards the end um, uh, an effect that I want to try to get a little discussion going on to see if you can put some clues together. Um, okay, so this, actually, let me put it again. This is a, is a simple example of, of a bender. This is a solid material uh, with a liquid crystal playing some role. What it's doing, there's light being shined on it, and it has an active motion. Right? So this is the system that I want to kind of take you through um, as a way of an example of uh, how uh, liquid crystals and solid body mechanics can be merged together um, in a way that is <coughs> useful for device design and useful for you know, understanding of materials. Now let me show you another uh, some similar example. So here, you have a much stronger light um, on one of these things, and it, it actually bends standing up like this. The light shines on it and it bends down so quickly that it occludes the light itself and it bends back and it gets a little cycle going. So you can see how these things can be um, potentially useful for, for stirring actuation. Um, these can be very small. This is, you know, this is on centimeter scale, this one, but they can in principle be very small. They can be used for microfluidics, things like that. I'll like to play one more time, so one more thing I want to point out about this. Um, notice that the actual, the, um, the spot that the laser light is shining on as the video plays kind of moves around relative to the, 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 the base of the cantilever. And the speed um, is purely just um, inertia limited, right? It's not being limited by whatever the optical effect is going on, which I'm sure you imagine, I'm sure you can guess, is what the liquid crystals are doing. Okay, these are solid little strips of material. Okay. So, let me tell you a little bit, a little something about elastomers, right? Elastomers are rubbers. Um, it's effectively a system where you have long polymer chains that are cross-linked together somewhat loosely to make kind of a bulk matrix, right? So this is a system where it has solid properties, right? You have rubber, it has bulk modulus. You pull on it, and then there's a force in response. It's hooky in up until you tear it. Um, but on the molecular scale, close to the polymer chains, it behaves like a liquid. The, the, the chains can flow. Um, it's only constrained in the sort of bulk sense. And so this is the first kind of sign that maybe something like this is compatible with a liquid crystal system. And lo and behold, it is. Um, there are a number of different ways to make it. I'm not a chemist, so I have no idea about the different you know, ways that people are able, you know, very clever ways people are able to make these things. Um, but they are, uh, it's wonderful. <coughs> so you can put uh, the little blue ellipses here are you should think of as the liquid crystal mesogens, and you can put them into the polymer. You can either have them sticking off the sides of the polymer backbone, or you can use them as the backbone itself if the chemistry works out. And when you do that, um, you do get the same sort of effects, the orientational effects, as you change the order parameter, as you go through the isotropic and nomadic transition. Because everything local in a polymer is fluid like liquid crystals in some sense don't care that they're, you know, so long as they're they're attached in such a way that they can swivel, that they can have some degree of freedom, they don't really care that they're attached to this polymer backbone. And they can go through the entire kind of litany of things that liquid crystals can do while they're attached to the polymer backbone. And that gives you this beautiful feedback with the solid properties, right? You have not only do you have the liquid crystal attached to the polymer backbone, and this makes it trivial, but it's important, to have the polymer backbone attached to the liquid crystal. And so, in particular, if you imagine, and I don't know how much you guys know about um, you know, polymers in general, but 
Uh, one kind of neat way of, of modeling a simple polymer is just as a random walk. Right? Random walks, on average, in three-dimensional space, make spherical, you know, they, they uh, cover a spherical area, a spherical volume. Um, <clears throat> and so, once you stick on these, imagine these pneumatic bits that are all lined up, because the, the backbone is sensitive to the direction of the liquid crystal, you change um, the ordering of the random walk is biased, right? And so when you do that, the um, radius of gyration becomes two different radii of gyration, you get an ellipsoid, and so you have some elongation in the direction that the pneumatic is all pointing, and you have some contraction, some sort of Poisson effect style contraction that I'll talk about later um, in the normal direction, right? So you get this kind of microscopic coupling to the way that the polymer is behaving. So this is some solid, Microscopic effect in the polymer. Okay, so <clears throat> notice that the degree, and I'll, I'll play this again after I talk, the degree to which um, the, polymer, the polymer is affected by the liquid crystal must have something to do with the order parameter, how lined up it is with the liquid crystal. Right? The more lined up it is, the more uh, you have an elongation in the direction of the liquid crystal. And you have this beautiful system by Pickelmann where there's this thin, you see the thin, long strip of a pneumatic rubber, and it's being heated and cooled. I'll play it again. So here it's being heated, so the uh, order parameter is going down. So they start out long, and the order parameter is going down, and they become more sphere like in the microscopic sense. And so they retract, and then it's cooled again, and they extend, and it's able to, you know, it lifts this weight up and back down just as a function of temperature. Right, so this is a bulk elastic effect purely driven by the pneumatic properties in the system. <coughs> okay, so this, there's another uh, very interesting thing that happens and, um, in uh, these pneumatic solids, in particular with the elastomers. Um, this is not an effect that, you know, for those um, cantilevers I showed you at the beginning that we're going to sort of go through, this has nothing to do with that, but I, I would feel I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about this, because this is one of the hot things about pneumatic elastomers, which is there's this soft um, elastic mode. So <clears throat> remember that everything is sort of liquid-like <coughs> locally um, on the polymer. If you take one of these things, imagine that you have some big mono domain of, of this pneumatic rubber, everybody's pointing up, all the match pointing up, you can grab it, you can pull on it, in, you know, out of the plane, right? Not, not up and down, but, you know, up right, or back, or south, whatever you want to call it. Right, so you apply some, you know, extensional stress to it. What's it going to do? Well, the pneumatic director, remember, is effectively free to rotate around. And so when you, you give it this external stress, the pneumatic director is just tip over, because by tipping over, they can affect the polymer in such a way that it gets longer at almost no energy cost, right? So you have this, it's referred to as a soft mode, where you can sort of freely, the stress strain curve is very flat initially and it pops up, right? You have some very free, free extension, and then once everybody's all tipped over and they can't go anymore, then you get into the hooky end regime where it's just like a, it's back to being a regular rubber again. So <clears throat> this, is, this is sort of an interesting effect, but I'm not going to say anything more about it. Okay. Um, so I've been, at the beginning of the talk I said we talked about magnetic solids or the crystal solids. So far I've always talked about elastomers. There's also a glassy state. Um, so what happens is you take one of the pneumatic elastomers and then you just keep cross-linking. In my little cartoon I should have had more places where they cross. Just put a little cross-linker <coughs> everywhere. cross the hell out of it. Um, and so what that does is it greatly restricts, of course, the strain response. You can't get these systems that flex by two, three, four hundred percent. But it also um, it also restricts the the, the uh, freedom of the the magnetic resonance in the ground. And so that might sound bad, but you still get the length changes. The order parameter, you know, as a function of the order parameter, the material still changes its dimensions. And so by staying where they are, uh, you can write some sort of pattern right into a uh, bulk piece of the solid and be sure that it doesn't have some external strain or something to kill it. Right? So those cantilevers at the beginning were glasses. 
they were used to doing classes, and they had there was some pattern in them that made them do what they did. Um, so this is just a quick uh, kind of head-to-head -head comparison of the elastomers versus the glasses. The elastomers can hit very high strains. They get soft mode, like I said. The glasses lower strains, but it's locked. The director is locked. Um, I don't want to keep you guys too far into that. Okay. So, uh, in, in addition to temperature, you can also activate these things any other way. You can activate, you can change the order parameter of uh, with the crystal. So, in particular, you can do something. Uh, people have done something very clever with using doping with the uh, isobenzene, so you can get uh, light effects where the molecules are rod like and then they're bent. Um, and once they're bent, that ruins the, the order. Um, and so that's, that's how the light, was, uh, the light effect happened in the two movies I showed at the beginning. Okay, so now going further, um, I want to, I need to say a few things just about elasticity in general. Um, and so the first thing I can say about elasticity in general is it is a very complicated subject, right? There's no way, even if I spent the entire lecture just on elasticity, that, you know, I could make it in a minute. Um, <coughs> that being said, I'm in the right limits, in the right approximations, it's not so bad. Um, so, how many of you have seen anything about stress or strain before? Show of hands. A few. All right, about half. That's decent. That's good. How many of you know what a tensor is? A little bit more than half. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I should tell you what a tensor is before I say anything else. Um, so a tensor is uh, is a linear object that relates other linear objects to one another. Right. So a matrix is a tensor that relates a vector to another vector. Right. A vector is a tensor as well, right? If that vector can relate, you know, a scalar to another vector, or you know, however you want to stick them together in a way that makes sense. <coughs> yes, Raymond. Excuse me, I thought a tensor was a tensor. Tensor can also be a tensor. In many ways, a tensor can be whatever you want it to be. Um, <laughs> you said vector is tensor. Sorry? You said vector is tensor. Vector is a tensor, yes. Um, so a tensor is actually a general term for a set of linear transformations. Uh, for all different linear transformations can be thought of as tensors. Um, and so, you know, most of the time, so that when people talk about the stress tensor or the strain tensor, those are actually matrices. Um, they're just the rank two tensors, the number of, the degree of complication you like of the object is the rank of the tensor. Um, and for a vector, it's rank one, for a scalar, it's rank zero, for a matrix, it's rank two. Um, there's this, this capital C guy in the middle here is rank four which is messy and bad, and you don't have to work with it if you can avoid it, and we're going to skirt around that. So the thing, for those of you that um, aren't familiar, the half of you that aren't familiar with stresses or strains, the sort of rough idea you want to keep in your head as I move on is that the stresses, so the picture on the right, um, thank you, Wikipedia, um, uh, it provides this a tiny little patch of material in the body, um, and when you take cuts of the material, the different faces of that cube, have some kind of residual forces on them, right? So you cut it out of material that the material could have been could have been holding some forces. Imagine a bunch of springs or something um, that were tense, right? And so when you cut, cut a plane through there and look at the different possible forces go, go through there, that's what the stress is, right? In some sort of broad sense. And you can get contributions to the stress purely from compression of the faces together or from uh, opposite faces moving relative to one another, right? That gives you, um, you know, a, a possible force through this point, right? This is called shear. Strains, you can think of as the actual movements inside the body, right? So the strains, so there's you here. Um, do people, are people, how many people are familiar with the little sub-index notation? Again, about that. Okay, so whenever you see um, <coughs> two indices underneath, one of the uh, one of the one of the variables that means it's a uh, matrix. It's a rank two. The number is the rank of the tensor. So it's a matrix. If there's two, if there's one, it's a vector. Um, if there's a comma, that means there's a derivative, but that's not important. Um, but in particular, the U is just a displacement. Right? So if you move, if you have some solid body like that cube, and you say you shear it, right? So it started like a cube. It ended up like. Um, Parallelogram, 3D parallelogram. I guess there's some work for that. Um, and so if you look at what individual points in the body did, there's some little displacement back. So that's what U is, and so the strain is just telling you in some kind of symmetrized sense 
uh, what the displacements are. And so when you displace something, there's a relationship between, a linear relationship between the stress and the strain. And this thing, this C, is called a compliance tensor that relates to them. And again, it's just a more complicated matrix. And in fact, because of the fact that it has a bunch of nice symmetries, you can write it just as a matrix. Right? Even though it's in general a rank 4 tensor, you can boil out the symmetries and write it as a rank 2 tensor if you write the stress and the strain as a as vector. Right? Where the vectors you take the, uh, the line directions with the compressional directions, and then in the rest of the vector you write the shear direction. Okay? So in general, for liquid crystal, go back to liquid crystals, right, because the whole thing, this whole week and a half is about liquid crystals. Um, you might imagine that you need a bunch of different material parameters to describe them. You need some information along the direction of liquid crystal, some information normal to the liquid crystal, right, and you'll need that information for, to couple the compressional senses and the shear senses, right, um, and also possibly to relate directions that you, if you press in one direction, you might get some strain in the opposite direction, right? That might have some smaller effect. So this is called Poisson ratio when that happens. You take a big block of rubber, you push on it, the sides will pop out, right? Everyone should be familiar with that. Um, and so if you say, all right, if you write down this, so a body that has the symmetries of a, of a pneumatic of a crystal is called uniaxial, right? There's one special excess. Uh, and so if you write down the compliance tensor with the symmetries of the uniaxial system, this is what you get, but that's too complicated too. Um, so we can imagine that it's actually an isotropic material, right? You can say it's just, it's from the point of view of the, of the um, material parameters, it's just a big block of rubber. Right? We don't care that it's a little crystal in there. The, the, the um, polymer chains are really what carry the uh, elasticity information. That up here. And this is an approximation. I want to say this is not exact. We're, you know, we're sort of sweeping some stuff under the rug, but it turns out not to really matter. So this is a lot easier. You know, it's a big matrix, yeah, but also lots of zeros, and the entries that it does have are simple. So that's good. Okay, so now we need to find a way to imagine how that bender, that cantilever, could be bending. Right? And so in order to get bending and elasticity, you want to get a system that uh, changes length in one sense on the bottom plane of the bender, and then changes length in the opposite sense on the top plane of the bender. Right? So if, there's my little, little sheet of paper. Uh, so if the, uh, the top of the paper gets shorter and the bottom of the paper gets longer, right, it's going to want to bend upwards. Right? It'll bend up like this because, you know, if you, if you imagine some thickness, it's, it's, you have like concentric circles, and the concentric circle from the top surface is, it says a lower length on the curve than the one on the bottom. Right, so that is sort of the primary effect that you get in a bending mode, in a bending system. You get length changes <coughs> through the thickness. So returning to our sort of a uh, 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 rough model of what happens with a little crystal solid where the length changes where uh, if, you, if you heat a system, uh, if now, uh, so I don't want to use this for multiple purposes, that's just a strip, a rubber strip. So if you, see, if you heat the pneumatic, right, uh, that destroys the rubber parameter, so it shrinks along the, the axis and it grows the other way. So if you cool the pneumatic bit, uh, it grows along the axis and it shrinks the other way. So what you want is to have some direction that changes you know, on the plane of the bottom of the bender. You want a direction, use the, the direction of the director to get a direction that grows in one, in one sense. And then by the time you get to the top, you want to change the direction of the liquid crystal so now that same direction relative to the bender is shrinking. And so if you imagine cooling the display bend system on the left, the pneumatic is uh, lying in the z direction, right at the bottom, it's lying like this. So if you cool it, it gets longer this way. But then by the time it comes to the top, it's pointing straight up and down. And so when you cool it, it shrinks. In that direction. So you should expect some bending, right? Um, the same thing with the twist configuration, right? In the twist configuration, you have uh, the exact same this on the bottom, and then it twists, twists around, right, like this, and then so it gets shorter in the z direction on top, and you expect the z bending. Okay? Um, 
Um, so let me again, so let me quickly return to this picture. This, this is what I was just saying. Um, so how, what is the actual formula for the way that um, you get the coupling of the uh, pneumatic solid deformations to the elastic body? Um, it turns out to be easy to write it in the frame of the director. No surprise, right? The director is the principal frame. It's, you have uh, direct um, extension this way and direct contraction is the other two directions. Um, so this is how you write it now. Again, this is uh, tensor notation, but so what? Um, okay, so now, since we wrote down uh, the strain in the frame, the principal frame of the pneumatic, and we actually care about what the bender is doing in the lab frame, right, the actual bender frame, <coughs> we need to relate them. Um, so because the texture we chose was very simple, you have some theta rotation uh, for the display bent case, and I'll call the, um, the rotation of plane phi for the twist case. Um, and you can just work it out, it's very it's just simple in your algebra to work out that these are the transformations where the prime coordinates are the ones that are uh, in the frame of the pneumatic, and the unprime coordinates are the ones that are in the body frame. Okay, so now, now that we have uh, the thermal strains worked out, we want to specify you know, all the strains in the bending handle. You imagine it's cut a little bit. And right, these are just repeats of what we have. So we expect some strains that are going to occur geometrically as a result of the fact that it's bending, and some strains right, that are going to occur as a result of, you're going to subtract off the strains that are occurring as a result of uh, the activity of the material. Right? The material, it wants to do that, so you subtract it off. And the bending is, cost, is going to cost it something, so that's a part of the contribution. So in the split bend case, you get uh, a geometric term the linear order that goes like one over the curvature of the bend, and you get just an average strain, it's the capital YY. Um, and uh, for the thermal case, for the YY strain, it's just perpendicular. Because remember the display bend, every, all the action was happening in the XZ plane, right? So this, this coordinate of Y was doing this, this coordinate of Y was doing this, right? There's no variance in Y at all. So the Y term in uh, the strain is very simple. Uh, the twist case is my term in the, uh, in the I'm sorry, so it's still in the display bend now in the z direction, the strain uh, is, has this angle dependent piece that comes from the fact you have the director's strain. Right? Um, the twist case is similar, but now instead of, um, uh, instead of y being the simple direction, x, the super short direction that we're virtually ignoring is the, is the easy direction. And so the rotation is coupling Y and Z. So you get the more complicated coastline term, angle dependent term in both cases. Okay, and this is again just pointing out the same thing with the one over the curvature, one of the one over the radius of the curvature, and then the average strain is the geometric pieces, and the rest is the ones arising from the thrust field. Okay, so now we can go back to that compliance tensor I wrote down a couple of slides ago and actually write down the relationship between the stress and the strain. This one, easy one, this is the one. So you can write down, you don't care about the shear modes, you don't care about the xx um, compression modes, you just care about uh, how the yy and the zz strains are coupled with the stresses. Right? And so you can invert those two equations, you get how the stresses are coupled with the strains, that's just algebra. Um, I can point out, I sort of alluded to this a second ago, uh, but because the uh, x direction, the through the thickness direction, is very thin, and because so because it's very thin, you expect the stress to be constant. Right? There's not enough um, space to have a variation, um, and because the cantilever has free boundaries, the constant stress must be zero because you're not going to be getting residual stress on the boundaries. Um, so now you can just write down the four the components of the forces, the components of the torques, as integrals over those faces. Remember the little cubes. Um, uh, in the picture for stress back in the beginning, you integrate over the different faces to get the total forces of the system and demand that they're all zero because it's, you know, it needs to be the equilibrium in a given moment. Okay? And the torques as well. So you can turn the crank on that. It's just an integral, it's not even a very complicated integral. Um, I, I forgot to specify the actual the variance in theta in thickness. It's just, it's just a way to draw the pictures. Um, but in principle, you could have something else. Uh, for the display bend case, it starts 
um, like planar anchoring to the, the bottom surface, and it ends up like on control bit, right? It goes from this to a normal bit surface. And you try to crank on the integrals, and you discover that you get a nice function for the curvature. Um, it depends on the strain in the z direction. Remember, z is the, was the long direction of the strip. Here's my strip. Z was the long direction of the strip. It's this way. Right? You get some average strain that builds up in the z direction as well, which is to be expected. You get nothing in the y direction, which is good, because for, well, for, a moment, for something we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and notice that the strain, this is the, the thermal strain, parallel and perpendicular to the pneumatic, if those are equal, then that means you don't even really have an event order there at all, right? If the, the length changes in the body are the same along the director as perpendicular to the director, then it's not, the director's no longer doing anything, and the curvature vanishes, so you don't get the bending right? For the twist configuration, again, just uh, going through a uh, on two angle, um, you again just turn the crank, the same, basically the same integrals, only now you get um, equal and opposite contributions to the bend along the z-axis and the bend along the y-axis, which was this way. Right? Remember, x, x is a tiny, tiny direction. Right? So, now I'm going to tell you that the, mo the movies I showed you at the beginning were the split bend case. Right? The twist case gives you some bending curve. And if you strain it a little bit, you get the picture on top. And if you strain it more than a little bit, you get the picture on the bottom. And this is the part where I told you at the beginning, I wanted to see if I could get some theories from the crowd, a little discussion going. <coughs> and I have a clue, if nobody gets anywhere, I have a clue to give you as well. So does anybody have a suggestion for why you might do the funny, swirly thing in the bottom? No answers from Randy yet. Any thoughts? Why do we have these situations? Yeah, yeah, the bottom on the bottom. Why for this is for the twist case where you have the where you have the director twisting through the thickness. And and where in particular you have after you've worked out the solutions to the curvatures, you have the system wants equal equal and opposite curvatures, one over the curvatures in the line direction. But you have on the external this can be the induced by only the Okay. That's right, that's right. So this is, this is, so the picture is the thermal system. Once you've strained it a lot thermally, it comes that. Just that. Okay. Yeah. Depends on the direction of the temperature gradients. You can have yep. a different direction. Right, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the question is, is why, why does it make a shape? Alright, so I'll give you the first clue. Well, the only clue before I actually give the answer. Um, so the first clue is that if, you, if it actually did what the equation said it did, Remember, I made a number of approximations. If it actually did what it said, I, what it, I said it did, um, it would have, you would have, remember the curvatures were equal and opposite in the orthogonal direction. So you would have curvature pointing up as you move this way, and curvature pointing down as you move this way. Right? And that makes a saddle shape. And I don't know how much you've played with paper before, probably a lot, um, but there's no way you can make a saddle shape out of this paper. Right? The reason why um, is that a saddle shape has Gaussian curvature. Right? It's an intrinsic thing. It's like taking paper, it's the opposite of the white. Taking paper and trying to smush it down onto a sphere. Right? And that causes paper to crumple, right? So Randy is making the paper into a ball. But that's not the same thing. Um, <laughs> but good try. Um, but this is, this is energetically very bad. Right? The bending energy is still like one of the thickness cubed. The stretch energy is still like one of the thickness, just one of the thickness. Um, it's way, way, way more costly. Um, to do this, to really do this. So the system isn't going to do this. So any thoughts on now, any thoughts? No? Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so the reason why the system makes the little, oh, it's still up here, uh, The reason why the system still makes the, 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 the little spirally shape is because now it has a choice, right? It can bend, it's, it's only permitted by the energy to bend in one direction, right? So it can either bend, um, directly along the z direction, you can bend directly along the y direction, which you can bend up directly along the z direction, you can bend down directly along the y direction, or it can do something in between, right? And so if it were to bend completely in one of the two directions, then it would become, it would 
be energetically most happy in that sense, the least happy in the other sense. And elastic energy, particularly in this limit, like to share, right? And that's you know some extra outside information, but they're they're kind of nice. And so you're you're going to find somewhere in between. And so what does that mean for it to bend somewhere in between? Well, that means I mean the bend is just a bend. It means that the um, direction of the bend will be some angle to the cantilever. And so if you attempt to bend the cantilever at some angle instead of where you started, you get you know, something that's sort of wrapping around the inside of the cylinder that looks a little bit like a helix, and that's that picture. Right? So that is what's going on. And so I hope um, that I've convinced you so far that, first of all, putting the crystals into these solids can make for some interesting effects. <coughs> Um, and that you can actually understand sort of a lot from some very limited approximations, right? The full blown elasticity theory is much, much worse than anything that I've shown you, but you can get a lot of mileage out of this, right? You, you don't actually have to go into the depths and define, you know, your deformation gradients and your left strain, your right strain, your right honorable strain, and all the other strains that there are. Um, okay, so let me shift gears for the last couple of minutes. And like I said, I don't want you to find your coffee break. There's a completely different way of coupling um, the pneumatic, and this is departing from the cantilevers now. Um, by, uh, so we had a, a director change through the thickness to get the bending effects. So now I want to talk about disclination effects. Right? So you can imagine still a very thin sheet. Now I'm sure you guys earlier today, maybe in the morning, people told you about disclination effects. Yes, no? A little bit. Defects. Disclination defects. Yeah, okay. So people are sort of tempted to respond, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is that there's a place, this is a disclamation defect, I'm going to say again, there's a place where the, the pneumatic direction of the pneumatic director is not defined. Right? So if you imagine lining the director up around concentric circles, when you go to the middle of all the concentric circles, what direction is it pointing in? Right? You know, if you come in from the top, it should be pointing like this. If you come in from the exact, it should be pointing like this. There's no definition. It's not still defined in the middle. And that's a, that's explanation of that because of the tension. Okay. Um, so that's that's there's a huge uh, rich zoo of behavior and interesting effects that you get from explanation defects and other de and uh, dislocation defects and smectics and other things. I think Randy might be telling you a little bit about that next after the coffee break. Um, <clears throat> so, but whether or not it's a defect, just imagine these patterns. Okay, in a flat sheet. And then imagine straining the same way before. So you say it's a glass, the director can't move around uh, other than changing its length, changing its length along the director and normal director. And you say, okay, well, what happens on these sheets? Well, you can look at the curve that lies parallel to the director. So remember, and I, I switched my patient here, the lambda is like, sort of like the string. Only now, when there's nothing, it's one, it's zero. Um, that's the deformation. Uh, <clears throat> so you look along. The pneumatic director and so imagine heating it. Uh, so on the circle in the material, you heat it and it shrinks. Right? That circle wants to shrink. Right? So lambda is less than one. And now you go and look along the radius of the, of the, uh, of the circle. Right? And now that radius is always exactly perpendicular to the director field. And when you heat it, it wants to get longer. Right? And so as you all know, the um, the, the ratio between a circle circumference and a circle radius is constant. You can't change it. That's not allowed. Um, but this appears to be changing it. Now, the less, uh, let's not talk about the radio case, which is the opposite. Uh, this, don't bring up that. It's complicated. Uh, but the point is, the point you should think of is that the, the, the radius of the circle, the, the ratio of the circumference to the radius has changed because of what happened. Right? Pi has changed. Um, and because we're out in Indiana, there must have been something real happening. Um, I don't know about the joke. Randy thought it That means that you're not in Euclidean geometry anymore. Right? It means that there's some shape, right? there's some curvature that's happened. And in particular, in this case, you're on a cone. Right? The cone has the exact same thing where um, every single concentric circle on a cone is somehow shorter than it should be if it were in the plane, and all the radii are somehow longer than they should be. And and do a little very simple trigonometry to relate the effective change in pi to, on the one hand, the opening angle of the cone, and on the other hand, 
they strain to be put in the pneumatic solid system. And so you get this sort of uh, this sort of bump actuator, right? You have this flat sheet, it kind of teepees up into the cone, and then you, you know, cycle the temperature back or stop trying to lay it on it, goes back down. Right? So you get this sort of breathing mode. If you had gone the other way, you get a crumpling mode, right? By the other way in the, um, the activation. So if you would cool it instead of heated it, um, you get uh, an cone. It's sort of really still a cone, but instead of the circumference is getting shorter, excuse me, the circumference get longer. And the circumference is get longer, but the radii get shorter. So it can't, the only way you can do that is to crumple out of the plane. And you get these funny flowery shapes, crumpled shapes. Um, and you can imagine going back to the actuators. You can imagine putting you know, one of these defects in an actuator, and instead of getting a bending mode, you can get a twist mode, or you can get uh, this kind of reversal mode, right? Um, so you can get different um, actuation behavior. And that looks about just right. So um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me now, or have a great Thank you.